and welcome back to Unearth the Past, a brand new family history and genealogy podcast brought to you by me, Dr. Michaela Hume. I hope you have had a really good week researching. Um, I know I ask you this question and I, I send positive vibes out every week. My week has actually not been that bad in terms of research. I've had some new clients come forward asking me if I'll research their family trees, which is always interesting. Um, I don't normally, as you guys know, take on a lot of clients just because of the academic side of my of my life. If you have any questions about any of the podcasts I've done so far, or you want to reach out to any of the guests, you can do so via my website, which is www.mikaylahume.com. Now, roll out the red carpet, folks. Have I got a treat for you. You guys know I'm a massive, massive fan of A House Through Time. I am passionate about house histories, if you're listening to this, you know that I'm always telling you to forget family trees, research the history of your home. Well, have I got an expert and a half. Can we all give a massive warm welcome to my favourite, bar none, house historian, Melanie Backhansen. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. <laughs> I don't often get that, so that's lovely. <laughs> oh, no, I no, well. love it. Yeah, I love it. Honestly, I always say to people, right? So when people think about, you know, family history and those genealogical skills that we use in research, not many people think about researching their homes, do they? Or the history of their home? Yeah, it's funny actually. I um, yeah, it, obviously family history is huge, and uh, people have a real personal um attachment. Obviously, it's their own family, so it's it's a big deal, but. Yeah, it's it's slowly becoming a bit more of a thing. I think um, the links between sort of family history and house history and local history are obviously very intertwined. So I think slowly but surely people are sort of doing their family and maybe they're finding a ancestral home or maybe they've I don't know they've just come across something to do with houses as they as they're researching and they're thinking oh I wonder what what was there before or I wonder what you know what how long they lived in that house and that's kind of kind of spurred them on and moved them on to house history so it's it's getting there but yeah it, it, to some degree you know family history is still still king <laughs> so let's start then right back at the beginning so how did you get interested in house histories where did it start for you well, um, it's gosh, it feels like a long story, but um, I I studied history at university. Um, but when I graduated, you know, there was nothing like this. Um, so I went into publishing for many years. Was in marketing and PR, so very very far away, far removed. Um, but it's through a very uh, complicated turn of events. I was looking for um, a new role, and I actually it was an estate agent who were were looking for someone who could do the historic research, but also had marketing and PR experience. So it was just that sort of random combination of skills. And I was, you know, right time, right place. Um, so I started with uh, Chesterton's estate agent and that I was employed specifically to research the history of the houses that they had on the market. So partly to gain publicity, to get features in newspapers and that sort of thing. Also to set them apart, you know, you know, there's obviously a lot of estate agents out there and this was something new and different that they could offer. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I, I kind of came into it. Um, and obviously it just fell in love with it. So I was with them for uh, close to six years. Um, and in the process, I was asked to write my first book. I was because of the nature of the publicity and and marketing. I was also featured in newspapers, and so it sort of gained a bit of a profile. And then Twitter was coming along, and so all these sort of things um, culminated, and it meant that I was starting to get asked to do more and more private commissions. So, uh, 2012, I I took the leap and became freelance, and haven't looked back. So it's just been brilliant. So more and more people want to know the history of the house so i you know researching houses all the way from devon to scotland so yeah it's quite quite an adventure so um it's it's brilliant and i absolutely love it so for people just starting off then 
where should they go? What should they do? What are the records that they need to be looking out for? Well, um, I the easiest thing actually is to go to the local archives. I think it, you can get a lot of sources online, um, but if you're really new to it and you don't know where you're going, it can you can get a bit mixed up. You can get a bit lost. Um, there's things like maps you can do online. That's very easy. The National Library of Scotland has uh, the Ordnance Survey maps digitized and online so you can freely search those and that's the entire country not just Scotland um, but and that's a good place to start to sort of get some at least a, a visual picture of what your the location of your house looked like um, and the 25 inch maps uh, are the, the were brilliant for um, providing more detail and they were produced mid mid to late-ish 19th century um, and then they were periodically updated. So you can sort of look at sort of 1860s and 70s, then like the 1890s, then the 1910s. And you can sort of track the visual picture of what the area looked like. Um, but beyond that, you start getting into a lot of familiar um, sources like the census returns. Um, there's things like uh, the trade directories or street directories, um, electoral registers. Um, but then you, you can... You start delving further into things like tax records. Um, then there's deeds. Um, there's, so there's actually the thing with house histories is there there are actually an enormous number of sources you can go to, but it's just piecing them all together. Um, and that's partly to sort of um, make sure you're looking at the right house for a start, um, but also that you've got the right details because you know some of them are a bit hit and miss, and there's gaps in some records and others. So. But a lot of that is in the local archives or the county record office for, for wherever the house is situated. Um, so so that's why I think it's easier if you're in the archives. Um, and all the archives actually have free access to things like Ancestry and Find My Past and the genealogist and things as well. So you can do the online records way while you're there. But then you can also look at the physical records, the books and things. And a lot of that isn't digitized. Um, depending on the area again it's it can be a bit hit and miss uh, again depending on where you are so some some counties some boroughs have a lot of records online whereas others have very little so it just depends on where you are but so that's my my main kind of um piece of advice if you are sort of wanting to jump into house histories is head down to the local archives or the record office. And also the archivist will be brilliant at sort of guiding you and directing you as to where to start and where to go. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my <laughs> my one tip. Um, and also one key thing, which again, with if you're into family history or, or any of that sort of historic research, um, is to work backwards in time. I think that's a key where I, I it can be really tempting when you're doing house histories. If you know that it's Georgian, for example, and you think, well, who was living there in 1750? And so, well, actually, you can't just jump back into 1750 because you really need to look at other records first later on and make sure you're looking at the right house. So things like house numbers, um, they change for a start, but the further back you go, there, there are no house numbers or even house names. You know, you you can be lucky and actually if you've got an old house which has had the same name for centuries but in a lot of cases um the house names and numbers change and then in earlier records it might not even be clearly identified so you might find so i've done i'm obsessed with guest houses okay so if, if any listeners have been on my website they'll know that i have wrote the history of guest houses i'm obsessed with them uh I don't know what it is about them Mel honestly I'm just like there I have a postcard collection and I must have well over 100 postcards Ooh. and what I thought I was going to do is actually trace the history of the houses on the front of these postcards there's only a couple of sort of uh like family dwellings most of them are guest houses from places up north like Blackpool and Rill so I've been doing that probably for a couple of years and I did turn it into a little podcast at, at one point um but I found and I don't know about you but when I wanted the really interesting detail like mm -hmm. the juicy bits newspapers were really helpful have you found yeah. them helpful in your research 
Oh yeah, enormously helpful. Yeah. And actually the digitization of newspapers has just has been a game changer. I think it you know, ten, twenty years ago you had to go to the British Library in Collendale and you had to search and if you if you were looking for a house name or a person's name without any kind of index, without any kind of idea of dates, then it was basically impossible. Um unless you had, you know, months and months to kind of tra- trail through newspapers. But um, yeah, they're enormously useful. Um, everything from looking for the house itself, so putting in number 33 Station Road or whatever it is, um, but also the details of the people. And that's where it really comes alive. So you've got things like announcements of births and, and marriages, engagements, burials uh, or funerals, um, but also things like um court records, which tell stories of crime and, you know, something scandalous happened at a house or or with the former owners and occupants or um and you can you can just find so much wonderful detail that just isn't in a lot of the other records so um it's yeah everything from announcements or advertisements for the house when it's being on uh being auctioned um or when the lady of the house is advertising for a new lady's maid or, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it, yeah, it just brings it alive and actually you get more of a sense of the people in the house. I know you mentioned it before, but how do you grapple with when you're looking at a record and like what you said, it's not identifiable? Like, are there some houses that are just are impossible to research? Because I know, for example, when you look at some early censuses, the numbers aren't there, are they? And like you say, numbers right. change. So how do you how do you deal with that, or can you just not? Well, this is where um, looking at lots of different sources helps. So you might, yeah, census is wonderful if you know what you're looking at. Um, but yeah, for a lot of villages and even small towns, you know, if they were in 1841, actually, if they were just small, a lot of them would have just been under the name of the village. There wasn't even street names or anything, let alone house numbers. Um, but I, the, the same happens with other records where you just get um, the name of a resident in a certain town or whatever. And that's where you actually start tracking back through the people. So right, you look okay. at the owners and the occupants. And that's why working backwards is really um, essential because you're working back from what you are definite about so you know that Mr Smith was in the house with his family in you know 1950 for example and then if you work back through things like electoral registers and trade directories and then the census and thing 1939 register is another big one um, but if you work back through those and you track where the house is clearly identified and you know the people you can see where things start to change Right. Um, but then also where the address disappears, you can start, if you already know that through the directory, for example, that in 1876, it was the Smith family. And then all of a sudden in the 1871 census, there's no addresses. But then if you know actually the Smith family and you know you get the right one, Smith's probably a bad example, but, <laughs> but if you've got, you know, if you've got the family name and you know it's John and you know it's Sarah and, you know, they've got three children. And it, so you can actually make sure you're looking at the right family. Um, then you can sort of identify. Um, but again, looking at different records, you piece it together. Um, tax records is, is a big one. So um, things like rate books, which is like, um, our modern day council tax but yeah. it was broken up into different rates so that's things like the poor rate which is probably the most common which was where a household was taxed on the value of their home to provide poor relief in that um, parish um, and the same for sewage rates lighting rates watching rates which is security um there's highway rates for the maintenance of the road so all the sort of stuff that we you know is in part of our council tax but it was sort of broken up um and so if you're tracking through who was paying the rates and then you can match that with the census and the trade directories and different things like that it you you can track the names of the people um and then you know where the where the house name changes or or the the numbers disappear or something you can still track it back through the people so that's basically what you end up doing. What is your favourite record 
So if we're researching the history house, do you have like a favorite record where you think, yeah, I'm going to get a lot of detail from this, or it might be slightly obscure, Mel, and you think, you know what, I don't think many people would have thought of this record, but it's actually really interesting. Oh, gosh, that's really tough, actually, because because I'm always a big, you know, supporter of multiple records. You've got to yeah. look at lots of different <laughs> records. Um I mean, actually, weirdly enough, the, the rate books and tax records, they really mm. don't sound sexy or exciting in any way, <laughs> but actually they can be enormously useful. Um, yeah. And they vary from county to county and parish to parish. But, um, yeah, it's tricky, though. I mean, the other thing you could slot in there with tax records is there's the 1910 valuation um, record, which it's it goes by a few different names, but it was... 1910 inland revenue valuation and all the the uh, David Lloyd George doomsday uh, but it was it was basically the survey of the nation's property for an introduction of a new tax between 1910 and 1915 um, the records are in the National Archives but you can find valuation records in county record offices. But the key thing with this is it, it was for the introduction of a new tax. So we'll throw that in there, no. uh, which actually didn't eventuate. Uh, but we're left with the records, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons is that it, it gives you a snapshot of 19, between 1910 and 1915. Um, and it provides details like whether it was freehold or leasehold. Also, if it was still copyhold, which that's an old term that was uh, essential for if your house was part of a manor and that that then yeah. gets more confusing into sort of manorial records and things but but it provides that information it also might it gives you the name of the owner the name of the occupant it gives you a description of the house which a lot of um, records just don't do um, and in some cases it obviously gives you then a valuation but then it also can provide a whole lot of things like when the last sale took place or when the last lease was signed. Um, it can actually, in some cases, they have drawings that provide a layout of the house and or a layout of the plot. Like if it was part of it, it was a farmhouse, for example. Sometimes you get details of the farmhouse, but then all the farm buildings that go along with it. So, so that's a wonderful source. And if you match that with the 1911 census, um, then you you can particularly then in the first world war certain records disappear for a period so but it's a really great snapshot and allows you to sort of look at what was going on at that pivotal moment and then you can go backwards or forwards depending on what you're what you're working on but um yeah and then there's another tax record which is the well technically the um tithe map uh and apportionment this was when the change from a tithe tax or tithe payment mm -hmm. was changing from goods to a, mon a monetary system. So prior to the 1840s um, or 1838 was when the tithe, I think it was 1838 or 1837, the tithe um, uh, uh, act was changed. And the key again is that you have a map that identifies the property and then the accompanying apportionment and it gives you the name of the owner the name of the occupant and then a, a brief description of the lands so it is very brief but it, it will provide at least um a key sort of identifier on the map and you can look at the house that you're looking at and then look at the apportionment and and gain who was living there who was the owner um and that's another key source again moving forward into the 19th century but moving backwards into the 18th century so it it's uh, another so i guess you could say tax records is my favorite but that there's a lot involved with that so there's a few key sources there what about maps i mean obviously maps are going to be important aren't they because they're going to sort of show us how an area has changed maybe how a street has changed what map do you think is particularly useful i suppose it does depend on the time i know i've got quite a few ordnance survey maps yeah behind me I think they've been useful for me over the years more from a family history point of view I suppose thinking about well could it be them on the census you know how close is that to where they lived before right but yeah. I take it do you use a lot of maps Mel in your research yeah yeah we do um, or I do um ordnance survey is probably the best in terms of particularly because it does give you a clear picture of the house um mm -hmm. I think a lot of other maps they're really useful um, 
for tracking, as I was just saying, with the tithe and the 1910 valuation, both based on maps. Um, but things like the tithe, it's never, it's not actually a clear identifier of the property. So it's often just a square or a box. Yeah. <laughs> so at, at least to some degree, it will, it's likely to sort of match and you're able to mm -hmm. see that it is pretty much on the same spot. Um, but it doesn't give you clear identifier of the house. But um, there's other things like enclosure maps, which are really helpful. And there, again, that was when changes to um, the nature of sort of land occupation changed. It's complicated, you know, basically when they were enclosing a lot of common lands and sort of reorganizing lands and they, it's it's controversial because it, it was meant the loss of the rights of a lot of people. Oh. Yeah, the poor people who actually yeah. had, previous to that, there was a sort of medieval system where you had rights to the land. You could go and um, you could graze your sheep or your pigs or your um uh, whatever animals, but you also had rights to sort of graze and forage and different parts of the commons and things. Anyway, so it reorganized all of that. Um, but again, it's based on a map. Um, and so you can actually visualize and you can see um, the house. Again, it's not a specific drawing, but it's a roughly, um, but then it also provides details of the, who was the owner and who was, who was the occupant sometimes. Um, yeah, it's it's a vital one for the sort of late 18th into the early 19th century, particularly where at that point we you're starting to get back into the 18th century and there are fewer detailed records. So it can be a real important one. So, for example, a house I'm working on at the moment, which is in Norfolk, um, and there's a lot of spec. It's, it's a bit of a mystery into the 18th century, but I've I've firmly got the details from the enclosure map in 1808. It just so happens that the owner owned vast sums of acreage and, you know, lands across half of, of that part of Norfolk. Um, but the house is clearly there and I can clearly identify it. And I know who the owner was and that helps piece it together so much with other records. So, yeah, the, the maps are really important and it, it's it. It helps because there are fewer sort of visual records. So I think, you know, being able to actually look at a map and get an idea of what was going on the area of the house itself, but also the street and the, uh, you know, the area around it, the town, the village, what was going on. So it can help sort of help put you into that, um, I guess, zone is probably the best word. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to piece together the history of a house, but you can actually visualize it and have a rough idea of the situation, say, for example, in 1808, and that helps enormously. So, um, yeah, the maps are, are a key thing. Do you also find in your research that the functionality of houses have changed? So, for example, I don't know, Victorian times, if you owned a shop, generally you lived above the shop, and then we get the, the suburbs and the the middle classes especially here in the northwest are moving out now you know they're moving towards nearer where the train stations are in the suburbs so do you tend to find that mel when you're researching them that sometimes you know <laughs> like i see some houses and especially that i come across in my research and you know there's a family living on every floor where mm -hmm. now those houses are worth millions you know and just yeah. one family occupies them but i know during my period You'd have had a family in the basement, a family on the ground. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, very much. It's 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 an ever evolve, ever evolving picture, I think, and that's and that's still true today. I think you know it's still constantly changing about how we live in houses, um, but definitely it's it it's constantly changing. And you know, a house might have been built, and actually this comes across in the series of House Through Time, where pretty much all of the houses featured went up and down in a sort of demographic scale and they started as sort of a single family dwelling with a sort of gentleman or a merchant who was doing very well. And then as the years went by, it maybe it became a bit more down and out. Then it was divided into flats or, you know, rented in lodging rooms and that sort of thing. And then it's come about again where it's now a single family home. So it happens all the time. And and as you say, even, even now, I'm you know, there's a constant sort of, cry for the the loss of the local pub you know and so mm. many local pubs are all being converted mm. into homes or flats and things so there's that sort of different use space as well so 
Um, and that happened over the years, you know, might have been a farmhouse, you get barns being converted, you know, all sorts of um, uh, commercial dwellings or, or sort of, um, yeah, farm dwellings is a big one, but it's it's constantly changing. Um, and yeah, it's funny because even in the house I live, I live in a um, converted Victorian house. Um, but weirdly enough, I haven't done it in depth. It's not my own home, but I, <laughs> yeah. um, I've done a snippet of research. And actually, mm-hmm. the first census after it was built, so actually just a few years, it was already divided into two households, So, mm-hmm. which I found really interesting. So I live in a part yeah. of southwest London, and it basically it was the expansion of the Underground Railway, you know, massively changed the way that people people lived in London. And so all of a sudden people are moving out because they can catch the, the underground. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you look at it and think, oh, it must have been a single family home, but pretty much straight away, it was already divided. So, um, and then that's changed over the years. So, and that's the same for urban houses as well as rural houses. And, you know, there's, there's all sorts of changes and that's sort of part of the fascination in a way and actually how life in a house changes. So it's the stories of the people, but how they lived, you know, as you say, like in certain certain times you know you had houses that were basically falling apart and were effectively slum housing and if they survived you know now they're all being done up and renovated and restored and and so it's constantly changing and that's part of its story we have um so in manchester back-to-back houses were sort of outlawed in uh, the mid-victorian period so they couldn't be built. People were still living in them, but you just yeah. couldn't build anymore. Um, for people that are listening that don't know what a back-to-back house is, if you can imagine like a row of terraces that are stuck together. So there's no alley at the back. You've just got a, basically a house at the front and then you've got a house stuck to it at the back. Mm. That is what back-to-backs are. But they were condemned even in the 19th century for basically yeah. encouraging the spread of disease. Um, they were not basically not fit for purpose they were put up very cheaply often by uh greedy landlords or or mill owners to house the workers but they were really not great in terms of ventilation and life expectancy in back-to-backs was was pretty dire um Mm. so they were outlawed even though people were were living in them and i obviously now uh work in birmingham and the national trust have a back-to-back museum which is probably quite bizarre yeah. actually to to my ancestors who lived in those type of houses that their house would be a museum because I think yeah. often when we think of turning a house into a museum we think of something like you know the National Trust with their big stately homes and yeah. you know but the fact that they've turned these sort of very working class houses into a museum is fascinating honestly it's fascinating yeah. to me if you're in Birmingham folks go and check it out I thoroughly thoroughly uh in, in, enjoyed it mm. um but yeah it's it's funny isn't it how these houses were were outlawed and yet people still thought it was acceptable for people to live in them well into you know well into the the 20th century these are yeah. not that long ago for a lot of us it's our great grandparents great great grandparents yeah yeah no i know it's and it's i mean it's sad but true and and yeah it's it's a constant um it's difficult not to um compare it to today actually and you know there's increasing stories about yeah dodgy landlords who are yeah. renting out i mean you know what there was a story in was it part of north london where man was uh renting out a a sort of semi-detached house or i I think it was a yeah anyway i don't know the specifics but it was a a normal sized house um and there was something like 30 people living in this one house he was just renting out floor space effectively um and it's it's really sad that that's sort of still carrying on um and yeah you i did actually a lot of work on this for the book a house through time which i wrote with david olasuga um because it was we were tracking the sort of evolution of houses from you know pre-medieval all the way through and this sort of way of cramming people in you know it's constant it seems to be certainly since 
maybe the 19th century, maybe even the 18th century, this idea of just making money out of an asset um, rather than it become rather than it being a home. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a constant sort of battle, a dichotomy between a home and an asset. Um, and it's tricky with people who just can't afford them. Um, and then you get this story um, and seems to be sort of the story of humanity about finding your space. Um, and yeah, the back to backs and the slum housing of the 19th century sadly continued into the 20th century and now the 21st century. So it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, I want to say it's depressing. But, um, it's certainly sad. Yeah. I know thinking about my own family, I mean, thinking about that idea of a house and a home, like mm. my own family moved so much <laughs> during the 19th century. Every census, every birth record or marriage record, they're at a new address. Yeah. They are constantly moving during that period. Mm. Did you find that the norm with working class families in your research, Mel, and and are working class houses harder to trace or does it just matter? Does it just depend on the house? Yeah, I think it just depends on the house. But um, but yeah, it's 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 kind of a common um sort of misno but well myth actually that people stayed in the same house for much longer or people stayed in the same village for generations and but actually it's not really true. Um, you know, I I've found the same thing with with my work and and that's everything from you know a two up two down all the way through to a a larger um sort of more comfortable size detached home actually people moved around a fair bit and mm-hmm. one of the key things with this as well is that certainly before the first world war i think the statistics are roughly 10 to 12 percent of people were were owner occupiers so you had a, as much as 90 percent of the nation did not own their own home everyone leased or rented a home and that was everything from a long-term lease that you might have if you're at a you're in a farm or actually if you're in a sort of stable large townhouse and you have sort of an ongoing lease for for decades or all the way down to people renting per month per week per day per night you know and depending on where you were in in the the social scale depended on your your status but it's yeah I think that's one of the main things is actually because people rented or or yeah as I say for a week or a month or even if something a bit more long term they moved about they they either because circumstances with work or just the ups and downs of their finances or finding a better place um it just yeah people moved about a lot and it it's also the case that you look at um the upper sort of echelons of society and you had someone who had their country estate or their country seat out in Lincolnshire or Berkshire or or Gloucestershire or wherever but then they would rent a house in London for the season and that didn't necessarily mean their own they didn't not all of them had their own townhouse in London they they rented for the season and actually there's another very important um, source which is the court guides which are only applicable to London because they were produced to list the people who were coming to London for the season but they were literally only there for six months maybe even less sometimes only three to six months um, so they don't appear in a lot of the official records because they just rented the space for uh, that you know could have been there could have been a few rooms it could have been a whole house um, and so even you know you've got lord and lady such and such who are in London for you know November 1832 through to you know March or April 19, uh, 1833 but so they won't actually appear in a, a lot of the records but so things like that where people moved about and and that is this yeah certainly with with working class but it, I do I don't think it's actually class specific I think people did just generally move far more often I mean certainly if you have a big stately home and it's actually been in the same family for, for centuries that's a whole different thing um but yeah I think even in the sort of what we would now call middle classes people did move about um so yeah it's it's part of a challenge actually because increasingly I'm like would you just stay would you just would would the same family stay there you know I've had some where there's just a turnover you're like oh please not another person (laughs) honestly I'm working on a really difficult case at the moment I'm trying to find somebody's like great great granddad 
-hmm. And I have him getting married in 1923. Mm -hmm. And he's got a really popular name. So I went to the 1921 census. I searched it by address thinking, come on, it's only a two year gap. Please be living in that. No, he's not. So, um, Mm Yeah, so I think DNA is going to be the next step with that one <laughs> because oh. you can't you can't outsmart me with the DNA, Mel. I'll yes. find you that way. If I can't find you on a paper record, I'll find you the DNA. Yeah. Um, can we talk about a house through time? Mm-hmm. So, very very popular series uh, in the UK. That's if our worldwide listeners do not know what it is. How would you sum it up? Well. Essentially, it is the story of one house through the generations. Yeah. Um, and there's there's four series. So there's uh, was it Liverpool, Newcastle, Bristol, and Leeds. Um, and it's the telling the story of, of one house in those places. And it's uh, everything from all the way back to when it was built through to the current day. And it's revealing the stories that you found find in the history of a house um so that's and they i mean it's just it's actually wonderful because it's even though there's literally only four houses um but it just it just proves and shows how much history you can find in just one house and Mm -hmm. it's everything from who the families were of course but also just the events that went on their work life how they how they fit into sort of more of a national story whether there was any crime or whether there was any controversy. Um, and it just, yeah, it's through the generations. It, it, it just um, it just provides such a wonderful glimpse of the, the broader history you can find, as well as the sort of intimate personal history you can find, um, just by looking into the history of a house. Which has been, out of all those houses you've mentioned, which has been your favourite house to sort of research and tell the story of? Oh, uh it is tricky because i had i i was involved in snippet i was brought in as a research consultant um to a team of researchers doing the sort of um the hard work so to speak but then they would contact me if they they hit a wall or if they had any trouble with certain things um and i was probably more involved with the bristol house um largely because it was one of the older houses um that they they featured um it's actually quite frustrating because it for the leeds house which was the, the most recent series that went out um they featured a, a victorian house but they actually had an, a much older house outside of leeds that we're going to feature um but and i was more involved with that as well but due to covid and there was another outbreak and down and whatnot they had to sort of go to plan b um which was a bit of a shame because that um that the other house had had yeah a lot more history and that was actually brilliant had, had fascinating stories but um for the bristol house i was sort of more heavily involved in tracking the earlier history particularly through land tax which was another source i haven't mentioned but again it's another tax record <laughs> um but the, what, what is brilliant, actually, in the Bristol records, um, their land tax goes back quite far. Um, a lot of land tax records only go from about the 1780s through to 1832, roughly. Um, and But the Bristol records went right back to the late 17th century. Um, and so that it allowed, it, it took some, again, it's a, the earlier records, this is a prime example, where actually it's just a list of names. So you have no clear identifier which name goes with which house so you actually sort of have to track um but again back us through time but you're also sort of almost tracking the neighbors as well to make sure you're looking at the right house um but it allowed us to really identify um the clear uh owner who happened to be the captain of a um a ship who was involved with the slave trade and that was a a huge part of the story with the bristol house so i think that probably was my favorite and a lot of other people have said that to me when I've been doing talks or whatever and everyone says oh the Bristol house was yeah <laughs> so yeah I'd probably say that but they're all they're all interesting and they all have um their their unique stories so yeah it's interesting talking to you um because there are a lot of uh things we research as house historians as genealogists um that don't make it onto the telly Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> me and Paul, Paul McNeil, who who comes on the podcast a lot, he's another expert with me on ITV's DNA journey. Yeah, and we tell some fascinating stories 
to our celebrities that don't make it on the telly. Oh. <laughs> and, and it's trying to understand the difference, I think, between us as, as researchers and as historians and also the story arc and yeah. the narrative that, that you know, that the director is who knows far better than us what makes a good story mm. and what makes a good tv show um but yeah we always say you know you talking about the other house that was researched in Leeds yeah it's the same for us we always have stories and we think they are fascinating but for whatever reason they just you know often things beyond our control just just don't make it on, onto tv yeah. yeah um can we talk a bit about your books before you go Mm-hmm. Yes. So you've written quite a few books. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Where um, where yeah. can we get those books? So your books haven't just focused on the history of a house, have they? You've also looked at towns and and streets. Yes. Um, yeah. So you were sort of you've expanded past the house. Now we're looking onto streets and. Um, Again, I take it it's just through your research, Mel. You just thought, you know, you wanted, you had all this research and you thought, I'll put it into a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. And um, it, yeah, again, it just sort of shows you how, how house histories are sort of interlinked with family history and local history because they, they are very much intertwined. Um, but it's, yeah, my first book was House Histories, which was, um, or is a, a collection of almost a hundred different houses. And so it's, mm-hmm. again, it's, and the key thing again is it's, it's ordinary houses. I want to say, um, not, not to downplay those houses because some of them are beautiful and wonderful and lovely. Um, but it's, I think that one of the things is that a lot of people say, oh, you have to live in a stately home or an old manor house or something for yeah. it to have any story or any history. Um, but actually it's not true at all. And I, so mm-hmm. the, the different houses in house histories just shows you that there's a real range of, you know, two up, two downs and cottages and rural locations and urban locations. And it's just, yeah, delving into their unique stories. Um, and then from that, I wrote Historic Streets and Squares, which was, it was primarily looking at a lot of well-known streets and squares. So everything from Portobello Road in London, um, to just trying to think Charlotte Square uh was it Queen Square in Bristol uh gotta remember them I've got a long list um <laughs> but yeah things like the shambles in York and uh, so a lot of these sort of more famous locations but how did they uh, part of the part of the book looks at how they became that or how they have been retained um but also how they developed over time and how they became the famous streets and squares that that we know today um, and that's everything from sort of luck that they weren't developed and they weren't knocked down, they weren't bombed, you know. The, um, but equally, they all have their own stories. And so um, whether they were the location of just a trade street or it was just local people working away through the generations or perhaps it was the location for a sort of a, a more exciting events. There was riots in Bristol was a, was a famous one. And actually so things like that. Um, but also, yeah, I'm just sort of looking down my list. There's everything from Gold Hill in, Gold Hill in Shaftesbury, um, Hollywell Street in Oxford, which is actually brilliant. It's one of the most amazing streets. It's actually sort of, if a lot of the time everyone goes to the Bodleian and the Radliffe, Radliffe yeah. Hamburg, but just around the corner is Hollywell Street. And it's a beautiful street of really old houses, mixed mashed, you know, lots of different mm-hmm. aged houses and it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, then you've got more famous, perhaps Grosvenor Square in London and Soho Square in London. Um, but it it features all sorts of places all over the country. Um, but it is just looking at, I guess it's the idea that if you're walking through these streets and squares, just taking a moment to sort of look up and just pause and actually mm-hmm. look at the different houses or look at the layout or whatever it is, and actually just having a moment of thinking, wow, this has been here for 200 300 years and I wonder who were the people that lived here before and all that sort of thing and that's that's sort of part of its um story that's yeah part of the book <laughs> if you are interested in purchasing any of Mel's books I'll put a link in the description so you'll be able to go on and and get those um I highly recommend them it's just a fantastic read if you are into your history Not even if, if, you know, you don't even have to be interested in house histories. If you are just interested in history, 
honestly check out Mel's books they are absolutely brilliant they are on my shelf here and I even oh. give them to my students to read oh. so yes yeah, so if you get chance honestly check those out now Mel I normally finish this bit of the podcast right by asking you if you could uh you know go into your family tree and pick somebody who would you invite for dinner well I'm not going to do that with you I'm going to do something a bit different right okay if we're at a dinner party and I said yeah. to you what has been the favorite what's been your favorite house that you've researched what would you yeah. say which is the one you would talk, tell me about I probably the one I tend to go to I mean there have been a few uh corkers as we say <laughs> um, yeah. but actually probably the one i go to first is is a house actually it's in a small village in the cotswolds um uh it's now gloucestershire was worcestershire um mm. but it started out as a farmhouse in the 16th century um and it was extended later uh, in the 18th century and sort of now is a sort of larger sort of comfortable large home big gardens um but it just had so much history it's it, it genuinely I was going through it just going no <laughs> so I basically I what is wonderful is actually it had the manorial record so I was actually able to trace not only the ownership but also the occupants all the way back to the 16th century which is it can be rare especially that sort of um time because a lot of the records only really showed the owners not the occupants um but i'm i discovered that it was at, at one point the bishops of worcester gave it and a lot of land around it to queen elizabeth the first so that was one thing i was in the archives and had one of those moments of like oh no <laughs> um yeah i know um but then she didn't hang on to it for long she gave it to her personal physician at the time which was someone called dr lopez and this is around the time of the Spanish Armada and all sorts of intrigue and the Elizabethan court and all sorts. Um, and it turns out he was accused of trying to poison the queen. Uh, and, it, you know, I think people have written whole books on this because it's right. one of, you know, given the times, there was all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts going on. So, but he was arrested and charged um, and he was put on the rack and all sorts of things, um, but he was finally executed. Um, and uh, yeah, all his property had, had passed on from there. Um, so that was a story and a half. And actually it's, it's supposed that the story of Dr. Lopez so much inspired Shakespeare that he based his character Shylock in the Merchant of Venice on Dr. Lopez. So, you know, when I'm telling the owners of the house that yeah. you talked to Elizabeth I and then Shakespeare and yeah. 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 So that, that went down well. But then later in the 18th century, it was um, owned by a man who became a merchant um, who based himself in Le Havre in France. Okay. Um, so, and actually, this was 1780s, 1790s into um, mm -hmm. the early 1800s. So, of course, there's a time of the French Revolution. There's all sorts going on. Um, but he became very wealthy and, and successful. Um, but he became friends with um, Thomas Jefferson, the future president of America or the United States, because he was leaving France uh, to go back to America. And he, and he went via La Havre. Um, he also became friendly with Mary Wollstonecraft because she was there and she'd just been right. She was pregnant with her first daughter, but she was writing her treatise on the French Revolution. So he actually rented rooms to Mary Wollstonecraft and he was a signatory on the birth of Fanny Imlay, her first daughter. So there's all this stuff. And it just and then later in the 20th century, it, the house was occupied by, by an Olympian. So all just it just every generation there was something fascinating with. And this one house just in a quiet village in the Cotswolds, and it just all this history came out. So it was just yeah, wonderful, wonderful history of a house. Melanie Beck Hansen, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, I really hope you'll come back on again. Um, yeah, and, and talk more about house histories um, if you want to get in touch with Melanie uh, you can either do so via her website which is www.house-historian.co.uk get in touch with us so have you been researching the history of your house have you found anything interesting out 
I'll happily share it on the podcast. You know, if you have, get in contact with me and let me know. If you want to contact me about anything to do with the podcast, you can do so via my website, which is www.michaelahume.com. Com. Apologies that there was no podcast last week. Uh, I actually was away and didn't have any internet, um, which was, you know, it took me back to 1992. Um, yeah, I had no internet, so I wasn't able to upload, but I did record a podcast last week, which you'll get in a couple of weeks' time. So have a great week, folks, and I shall see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.